Welcome back to the course Fundamentals of Operating Systems. This is lesson two of our discussion of virtual memory. This is based on the textbook Operating System Concepts, 10th edition, by Silbershots, Gagney, and Galvin, published by Wiley Publishing. Let's just pick up where we left off. Consider how an executable program might be loaded from secondary storage into memory. The strategy we're discussing now is to load pages only as they are needed. The technique is known as demand paging and is commonly used in virtual memory systems. With demand paged virtual memory, pages are loaded only when they're demanded during program execution. Pages that are never accessed are never loaded into memory. A demand paging system is like the paging system with swapping that we talked about in the last unit where processes rise in secondary storage when they don't have the CPU. Demand paging explains one of the primary benefits of virtual memory. By loading only the portions of the programs that are needed, memory is used more effectively. With demand paging, while a process is executing, some pages will be loaded into memory and some will be in secondary storage. Therefore, we need some form of hardware support to distinguish between the two. We can use a valid invalid bit scheme for this purpose. This time, however, when the bit is set to valid, the associated page is both legal and in memory. You remember in the last lesson when it was set to valid, it was a legal address. Now valid means it is both legal and in memory. If the bit is set to invalid, the page is either not a valid memory request or it's valid but is currently in secondary storage. By not valid, I mean that it's not in the logical address space of the process. The page table entry for a page that is brought into memory is set as usual, but a page table entry of a page that is not currently in memory is simply marked invalid, as you can see here. Marking a page invalid will have no effect if the process never attempts to access that page. What happens if the process tries to access a page that was not brought into memory? Accessing a page that's marked invalid causes a page fault. The paging hardware in translating the address through the page table will notice that the invalid bit is set and cause a trap to the operating system. This trap is the result of the operating system's failure to bring the desired page into memory. Now you remember a trap is that kind of an interrupt that is caused by an error. And in this case, the error happens to be that the page is not in memory. The process for handling this page fault is straightforward as we can see here. One, we check the internal table which is kept in the process control block for this process to determine whether the reference was valid or invalid. Two, if the reference is invalid, we terminate the process. If it was valid, but we have not yet brought in that page, we now page it in. Three, we find a free frame by taking one from the free frame list, for example. Four, we schedule a secondary storage operation to read the desired page into the newly allocated frame. Five, when the storage read is complete, we modify the internal table kept with the process and the page table to indicate that the page is now in memory. Six, we restart the instruction that was interrupted by that trap. The process can now access the page as though it had always been in memory. In the extreme case, we can start executing a process with no pages in memory. When the operating system sets the instruction pointer to the first instruction of the process, which is on a non-memory resident page, the process immediately faults for the page. 
After this page is brought into memory, the process continues to execute, faulting as necessary until every page it needs is in memory. At that point, there's no need for more faults. This scheme is pure demand paging. Never bring a page into memory until it's required. Theoretically, some programs could access several pages of memory with each instruction execution. One page for the instruction and several pages for data, possibly causing multiple page faults per instruction. This situation would result in unacceptable system performance. Fortunately, analysis of running processes shows that this behavior is very unlikely. Programs tend to have locality of reference, described in the last unit, which results in reasonable performance for demand paging. The hardware to support demand paging is the same as the hardware for paging and swapping. You need a page table, which can mark the entry invalid through a valid invalid bit or a special value of protection bits. It uses secondary memory. This memory holds those pages that are not present in main memory. The secondary storage is usually a high-speed hard drive. It's known as a swap device. The section of storage used for this purpose is also known as swap space. A crucial requirement for demand paging is the ability to restart any instruction after a page fault. Because we save the state, that is the registers, condition code, instruction counter, and so on, of the interrupted process when the page fault occurs, we must be able to restart the process in the same place and the same state. Only this time, the desired page is now in memory and is accessible. In most cases, this requirement is easy to meet. If the page fault occurs on the instruction fetch, we can restart by fetching the instruction again. If a page fault occurs while we are fetching an operand, we must fetch and decode the instruction again and then fetch the operand. Paging is added between the CPU and the memory in the computer system, and it should be entirely transparent to the process. By transparent, I mean that the procedures taking place should be irrelevant to the process itself. Some often assume that paging can be added to any system. Although this assumption is true for a non-demand paging environment, where a page fault represents a fatal error, it is not true where a page fault means only that an additional page must be brought into memory and the process restarted. When a page fault occurs, the operating system must bring the desired page from secondary storage into main memory. To resolve page faults, most operating systems maintain a free frame list, a pool of free frames for satisfying such requests. Free frames must also be allocated when the stack or the heap segments of a process expand. Operating systems typically allocate free frames using a technique known as zero fill on demand. Zero fill on demand frames are zeroed out before being allocated, therefore erasing their previous contents. You can imagine the potential security implications of not clearing the contents of a frame before reassigning it. When a system starts up, all available memory is placed in the free frame list. As frames are requested, for example through demand paging, the size of the free frame list shrinks. At some point, the list either falls to zero or falls below a certain threshold, at which point it must be repopulated. We'll talk about how this is done a little bit later. Demand paging can significantly affect the performance of a computer system. As long as no page fault occurs, the effective access time is equal to the memory access time. If, however, a page fault occurs, it's necessary to first read the relevant page from secondary storage and then access the desired instruction. 
To compute the effective access time, we must know how much time is needed to service a page fault. As we can see here, a page fault causes the following sequence to occur. Now you can read this yourself, but I think I'll just go ahead and go through them quickly. First, it must trap to the operating system. Page, it is requesting a page that is not in memory, therefore it issues an error, a trap, which is sent to the operating system. It's necessary to save the job's registers and the process state. Then it's necessary to determine if the interrupt was a page fault. It could have been some other kind of fault. Fourthly, check to see that the page reference was legal and determine the location of the page in secondary storage. Then issue a read from the storage to a free frame. This involves waiting in a queue until the read request is serviced and then waiting for the device seek and or latency time. Then begin the transfer of the page to a free frame. While waiting, allocate the CPU core to some other process. Remember, we got to keep this process booked. Can't have it sit around waiting on a page to be brought in from memory, can we? Receive an interrupt from the storage input output system, which will let the operating system know that the request has been completed. Save the registers and process state for that other process that's running. Then determine that the interrupt was from the secondary storage device. Then correct the page table and the other tables to show that the page is now in memory. Wait for the CPU core to be allocated to this process again. And finally, restore the registers, process state, and the new page table and then resume the interrupted instruction. Not all these steps are necessary in every case. For example, we're assuming that in step 6, the CPU is allocated to another process while the input-output occurs. This arrangement allows multiprogramming to maintain that CPU utilization, but requires additional time to resume the page fault service routine when the transfer is complete. In any case, there are three major task components of the page fault service time. The first major task is to service the page fault interrupt. The next task is to read in the page. And the third task is to restart the process. The first and third tasks can be reduced with careful coding to several hundred instructions. These tasks may take from one to a hundred milliseconds each. Let's consider the case of hard disk drives being used as the paging device. The page switch time will probably be close to 8 milliseconds. A typical hard disk has an average latency of 3 milliseconds, it has a seek of 5 milliseconds, and it has a transfer time of 0.05 milliseconds. So the total paging time is about 8 milliseconds including the hardware and the software time. Now you do remember from your earlier courses that drive latency is the time it takes to rotate the disk. Then to seek time is the time it takes to move the head across the tracks to the right track. And then the transfer time is the time it takes to transfer the material from the drive. Sure, you remember all that. Remember also that we're looking at only the device service time. If other processes are waiting in the queue for the device, we must add in the queuing time as we wait for the paging device to be free to service our request, increasing even more the time to page in. We see then that the effective access time is directly proportional to the page fault rate. The computer will be slowed by a factor of 40 because of demand paging. If we want performance degradation to be less than 10%, we need to keep the probability of page faults low. That is, to keep the slowdown due to paging at a reasonable level, your authors think that we should allow fewer than one memory access out of 399,990 to page fault. 
So it's important to keep the page fault rate low in a demand page and system. Otherwise, the effective access time increases, slowing process execution dramatically. Well, that was a pretty good lesson. Let's stop here and take a break. Update your study guide. Go over your notes, and when you're ready, come on back, and we'll go to lesson number three.